experience is the knowledge one acquires by observation or by exposure. One can look at a thing and deduce from it certain truths and principles. For example, one can look at a ball through experience determine that it is round, either by sight or by touch. One can, through experience of touching water or fire, learn that the one is wet and cold and the other is amorphous and hot. This kind of knowledge is also direct and immediate, like instinct, but unlike instinct is learned. So experience is something that happens to you or that you do, right? So reading a book, you might learn something, but that's not experience because you're reading about someone else's experience or, or someone else's intuition. And so by doing all of these things, you, you build this base of knowledge. But now experience is a useful source of knowledge, but in the modern age, it's been overprivileged because in one sense, it's physically impossible to have every kind of experience that there is. And so if we constantly hit the reset button on knowledge every generation, which modern technological societies try to do, we lose ground because there's no way to have the experiences necessary to build this cumulative knowledge between people. And so, well, on the one hand is sort of extremely potent. It's also very narrow and it's hard to cast in a broad net. Now, one of the most effective ways of teaching is by having an environment in which everybody has to experience the same thing. And that creates a basis of commonality, a basis of agreement, which is why, for example, in the army, everybody goes through boot camp. Or why if you read classical history, the, pol the, the polis of the Greeks or the Roman Republic, there were, well, more broadly in any, so in any society, there were traditions and cultural norms that all people were exposed, expected to participate in, in order that they might have a shared experience from which to relate to each other in which they can then use to build further their civilization. So for example, if you have two people with radically different experiences, their ability to communicate is radically reduced and their, prop their propensity for violence is proportionally increased. So in one sense, having similar experiences is very important for maintaining some sort of status quo. We say that, I would say that experience is learned, right? It's something that you do or is done to you. So it's both external and internal. It's weak mediation, so it's through the five senses. And it's not necessarily an act of the will or an impulse, right? You might choose to have an experience in which case it's the act of the will, or it might be something that is done to you either by circumstance that you find yourself in or someone else's will. So it, it can have a, a bunch of different uh, directions in that, of origin in that sense. And then lastly, we have testimony. Testimony is to present a fact as evidence. Now, that doesn't mean the testimony is true, but it's presumed to be true. And, you know, think of in a court case, the attempt is to prove it false. So, right. Testimony can come from speech, a spoken word, or a text, a book, the internet. For example, in a text, or one would have to determine the veracity of the text, often by referring to other texts. This is often done in Christian apologetics. The Bible is tested against itself for internal consistency and against other historical and written sources. The same thing is done in a court of law, where the testimony of a witness is compared against other things. The witness has said, or for internal consistency or against the testimony of other witnesses. And, and, and through a give and take here, you can then determine the truth of the matter. Now, testimonies can then be weighed, right? Not all testimonies are considered equally true or probable or useful. And they can be tested in part and by using all the forms of knowledge we mentioned before and then against each other. Now, we would say that testimony is something that is, in the case of personal testimony, it's innate. It's, you know, you giving your thoughts on the situation. If it's something like a book 
or a speech or a YouTube video, then it's external because you're getting the testimony from someone else. So it depends on the kind of testimony and the nature of it, whether it's internal or external. It's, it's innate if it's um, coming from the speaker in a case of a court, but it could be strongly mediated if it comes from someone else or from a speech, lecture, or YouTube video. And it is an act of the will, not an impulse. Size testimony. Now, all forms of knowledge, if properly internalized, will actually begin to look a lot like instinct in the sense that it's immediate and becomes, well, it's not innate in the sense that you were born with it, but it becomes a part of your essence, your substance. So it's similar to innate that it's indistinguishably a part of you, but it had to be learned rather than something you had at birth. So I don't know what you call that. It's sort of like, it's sort of like innate, but you had to learn it. So in the life-giving sword, Yagumi Nori speaks of the learning the art of swordship being something that the apprentice first thinks about. He thinks about the exercises and the positions, but that, that is something that he should eventually stop thinking about. Because in stop thinking, when he stops thinking about it, that means he has internalized it to the point. So it's a conditioned response, right? Back to my earlier version, it's a conditioned response. It's something that he no longer has to think about. And he argues that holding, keeping thoughts in your head is like holding something in your hand. And so in order to hold new things in your hand, you then have to empty your hand. Now, you don't want to drop it and forget about it. You want to internalize it and make it a part of you. Now, this is something that is very similar. Well, actually, this predates, of course, Sherlock Holmes. But it's very similar to a Sherlock Holmes story, The Study in Scarlet, in which I will read the important element here. So this is Sherlock Holmes speaking to Watson about the mind. And this is very similar to what Minonori is talking about. Sherlock Holmes. You see, he explained, I consider that a man's brain is originally, is originally like a little empty attic. And you have to stock it with such furniture as you choose. A fool takes in all the lumber of every sort that he comes across so that the knowledge which might be useful to him gets crowded out or at best is jumbled up with a lot of other things so he has difficulty in laying, hand, laying his hands upon it. Now the skillful workman is very careful indeed as to what he takes into his brain attic. He will have nothing but the tools which may help him in doing his work. But of these he has a large assortment and all in the most perfect order. It is a mistake to think that this little room has elastic walls and can descend to any extent. Depend upon it, there comes a time when for every addition of knowledge, you forget something that you knew before. It is of the highest importance, therefore, not to have useless facts elbowing out the useful ones. Now, Doyle is differing a little bit from Minnori because he argues that the attic will eventually get full uh, and that these things aren't necessarily directly absorbed into you. Now, I don't know if Minonori would say that all thoughts have to be absorbed into you, but it's there's a similar rhythm to this way of thinking about ideas. And it's one that we've often lost in being inundated by noise and the, the vomit of popular culture and, and just all sorts of competing ideologies and ideas which just drown everything out. And then you have this jumbled up brain attic with nothing that sticks together, that nothing holds together. And it's just kind of a disordered mess, which is then reflected in society. Uh, Muninori also talks about how an idea, when it is developed, thought, when it is developed in the mind, is like the moon casting its shadow on a pool of water, where the pool of water is the human body. As soon as the mind comes up with the idea, the so as soon as the moon moves, the moon's reflection in the water moves at the same time. In such a fashion, he says, the uh, samurai ought to have his mind, the thought in his mind move in such a way that his body moves immediately with it. 
Another example might be seeing one's reflection in a mirror. As you move, the reflection on the mirror moves simultaneously. And he argues that the body ought to move in the same way. All education is like this. All lessons learned are meant to get to the point where it is like the moon casting this reflection on the water and then moving immediately. So how does this, how do all these classifications help? Well, first of all, they sort of compartmentalize different modes of knowing because people often get confused and sloppy when they say things about knowing, right? So one of the things that we saw in the heyday of the new atheist movement was this, they wanted to caricature faith as a bad epistemology, i.e. a means of knowing something that's false. Now, that's just sloppy, right? Faith isn't an epistemology. It's not the means of knowing something, right? Faith comes from the Latin fides, which means to have trust in or trustworthy. So when you when you say that you have faith in God, that's not the same as saying, I believe in God, but rather, I already believe in God. Therefore, I believe God will do what he says he will do. Now, that's just sloppy and lazy and, and, and incompetent. But this kind of sloppy way of speaking about how we come come to know things, which is more broadly called epistemology, and more broadly would include also how we know things to be true, which is not a part of tonight's discussion, we can then begin to see what these kinds of things are. So then to go back to this new atheist conundrum, what where where does the Christian get the belief that God exists? Well, one is testimony, and that comes in two two sources. Nature which the psalmist says testifies to the existence of God, and then also the Bible, right? And then also you could say, for those who are Christians, the presence of the Holy Spirit in them. Now, that wouldn't the last one wouldn't be testimony, it would be experience. And it would be an experience that one was uh, exposed to because one chose to be a Christian, presumably because A, he was convinced by the testimony of nature and or the Bible or was exposed to someone else who had the Holy Spirit and was convic convinced by that. But neither of those are what we would call faith, right? You don't, you have, when you say you have faith in something, that means you believe it's reliable, not that you believe it exists. You, you already have to believe it exists to have faith in it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have faith in something that doesn't exist. So one way that this is useful is that it helps deal with some of these, or also too, people say, I feel when, or sorry, and they mean by that, I'm thinking something, when a feeling is not a thought. And it's another, it's a sloppy, confused way of discussing things, in part because they weren't educated to distinguish it. That's not to say that feelings cannot be a source of knowledge. They can, that can often be, experience related or intuition or even an instinct but that's not a that's a, that's an impulse that's not a thought and so we can come to beliefs through either impulses or thoughts and when they say i feel something most people mean by that that they're thinking which is actually the opposite of what they're doing that doesn't necessarily invalidate their feelings but again it's a it's a sloppy way of describing it and in fact, they often, people who say that often don't do much thinking, which is the problem. They're, they're partly overwhelmed by their experiences and their feelings, and their impulses, and they don't really know how to suss that out. And so doing this helps suss that out. Also, in general, uh, when you can perform or form some sort of ordered whole to understand something, in this case, epistemology, it's helpful in understanding it in general and communicating that knowledge to other people. Because order is better than disorder, right? I mean, if you want to live in a house, you want it to be built along proper engineering principles in an orderly fashion, rather than a slipshod ransackle shack. The same would go for a belief system. If it's organized and well-structured, then it will last. 
one of the things we've seen over the last 20 years is modern ideology, modern philosophy is slipshod, ramshackle, and disorganized, which is why so much of it is falling apart. Certain ideologies had much higher cachet than they do now. Uh, for example, after 1991, communism took a nosedive. Uh, and then, of course, in more recent times, new atheism has taken a nosedive. In fact, Richard Dawkins has admitted that the new atheist movement failed and that they need Christian allies against the Wokies. So, yeah, there's that. <laughs>